And we are back. Well, folks, I hope that you are strapped in and ready to go because do I have a panel for you? Oh, good Lord. Here we go. The mechanics of magic systems. How do they work? Balance. All of these things. Costs. We're going to talk about everything. But first, let me welcome my incredible guests to the stage. You won't believe it. I still don't. Welcome, please. Keith Baker, Celeste Conowich, and Shane Hensley. I have brought you the cream of world building today to talk about magic systems. Keith, how are you doing? I am doing great. Oh, my sound is such, working. Your sound is working? It's an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you here. Let me introduce you properly. Keith Baker is best known for creating the Eberron campaign setting for Dungeons and Dragons and the story cut storytelling card gloom which is by the way one of my favorite games ever he's produced a host of games novels and ttrpg supplements and currently is developing the story for airship syndicates upcoming mmorpg wayfinder and just released the second edit of Illimat with his own company together studios go find keith at together studios do it do it now but then come back here because i need to introduce the amazing shane hensley shane hensley how are you doing I'm fantastic. Thank you for asking. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Shane Hensley is the president, sir, of Pinnacle Entertainment Group, a former designer, game writer, and executive producer. I would say once a game designer, always a game designer, uh, on several AAA video games. He has an MA in military history, was a longtime freelance game designer, novelist, and writer for TSR, West End Games, and many others. And, and is the creator of the Deadlands intellectual property, the Great Rail Wars miniatures game, and, and Savage Freaking Worlds role-playing game system. Yes, that's Shane Hensley. He lives in Arizona, USA, but today he's here with us. Shane, such a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much. I didn't realize that you were the Janet that I watched on the Sinister Secrets of Saltmarsh actual mm. play. Which yeah, that was I don't watch a lot of actual plays, but that one was fantastic, and you were excellent. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, the uh, the mermaid paladin Lahuna, who just couldn't couldn't stop riding weird <laughs> creatures. I mean, what are you going to do? You were excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so, so very much, Shane. That means so much coming from you. And finally, everyone's favorite kobold. Can I say that? I can't say that. I love all the kobolds. It's Celeste <laughs> Conowich. Celeste, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Really excited to be back and uh, part of this awesome event. I know, right? I know, right? One thousand very cool. Ninety-seven <laughs> viewers and counting have all come to hear us talk about world building. So let me introduce the amazing Celeste Conowich. Celeste Conowich is a game designer based in Seattle. She is the producer, DM, and editor of the actual play podcast Venture Maidens. And when not plotting behind the street screen, you can find her. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. You can catch her championing fem lead shows as co-founder of the Penich Studio Podcast Network, and also lead designer at Cobalt Press on Project Black Flag, I believe. Yes. Yes. Bravo. I can't, I can't find a non-creepy way to say, "Can I see your T-shirt?" So I'm just going to say, "Can we see oh. your T-shirt?" Oh yes, I've got the cobalt. I'm repping it today. Yeah, uh, yeah. Flag, flag. Flag. Ready, showing up in Love force. It. I'm, <laughs> I'm going with the black flag. It's just black. There you go. You know, yeah, thank uh, you. For the we all had the same idea. Shane, too. I see. Yeah, yeah Shane. We, we seem to have all got the memo. 100%. I appreciate yeah, I gotta, that. Thank you, everybody, for coordinating. Pinnacle shirt behind me, but it's <laughs> yeah. hot here today. So. Okay, well, we should start talking about magic systems, because once you start, you just can't stop. Um, and actually, that is my first question. Where do you start when creating a magic system? We have a free-for-all system here at World Anvil, so either wave your hand or just start talking, and I will moderate you accordingly. I think, yeah, I think I'm just jumping in. Yeah, uh, don't I too polite. Let's two, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's two sort of interesting questions here to me, uh, which are where you start with magic when you're creating something entirely from scratch, and how you consider the impact of magic of an existing system when you're making something like a setting for D and D or something like that. Since you said, where do you start at all? Uh, the key question to me is the role you want magic to play in the world, because there's two sort of very fundamentally different sort of ends of the spectrum you can go from, which is on the one hand, magic as a reliable tool, 
which is what we generally see in games like Dungeons and Dragons, which are among other things, tactical games where magic is something reliable. We know how it works. We're just establishing the details versus in a lot of other sort of fantasy medias, part of the point of magic is to be more mysterious and unreliable than technology or science. And so I think that's sort of the first step I would just say is, are you approaching magic as a science or are you approaching magic as a mystery? Mm -hmm. uh, because either way, that's going to give you a very different flavor and you're going to want to design your system accordingly. That Can hard it? versus soft magic question. Yeah, absolutely. basically, yes. Yeah. Shane, what are your thoughts? Where do you start when creating a magic system? So I was thinking about this and my first uh, real delve into it was when I worked on Dark Sun for TSR eons ago. <clears throat> and um, I wrote the clerics book, which was Earth, Fire, Water and Air. And I was giving very I was given very specific guidelines at the time for how to escalate the power of spells up through the levels. Right. And the uh, the process is essentially, you know, start at this amount of dice and average damage work your way up and add a special effect at each level that would make you perhaps want to return to that spell at a higher level. I don't think you could cast at higher levels at, at that time. So I did that and I, and I, I thought about it quite a bit by the time we got to uh, Deadlands, <clears throat> the original version, and we wanted every different type of spellcaster to feel very different. So we okay. wanted... <clears throat> Indian shamans to feel like real Indian magic. We wanted sand tables and self mutilation and all the stuff that you know, is, is traditional plains Indian, particularly uh, magic. So, you know, I, I dug into that. We wanted our huckster magic, which uses poker cards and, 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 and actual card decks in the game to feel different. We wanted mad science to feel different. Every, we wanted everything to feel different. And what I learned from that experience was that designing all of these different systems made it pretty hard for people to play, yeah. right? So they were really cool, they were really flavorful, but but it was just tough to remember, you know, how does this thing that that basically is a, is a magic missile work in the Indian shaman system versus you know, the mad science system? So by the time we got to Savage Worlds, which is a, we call it a universal system, not a generic system, our thought was, well, when we play Hell on Earth or Lost Colony or Rippers or 50 Fathoms or any of our games, we kind of just want a magic missile to be the bolt spell. And you will know how it works every time. Now, the downside to that is it has a lot less flavor, right? So what we try to do is we give them names in world that feel very different to, you know, just bolt, which is the actual power name. Does that work? It does for some. It doesn't for others. If, Go ahead. if I can add, add to that for just a moment, I mean, one of the things that I feel is that really is something you can encourage with just like basic D D or D D type systems one of the things in particular with uh eberron coming out recently is that the artificer as a spell caster casts spells the same spells everybody else uses has a spell list but one of the things is that they have to use a tool as a magic as a as a spell casting focus and i've written a whole little thing basically about what you need to think about is, yes, your character is just casting heat metal or is just casting enhanced ability, uh, but what does it look like? How, how are you using the tool? If you're using calligraphers tools, then you're presumably like drawing sigils. If you're using tinkers tools, what are you making to produce that effect? And even just when I play an artificer, when I use the cantrip guidance, Guidance is just a simple thing that gives someone a plus 1d4 to a roll. I will always say, what am I making? How am I giving them this bonus? Oh, here, take some of this magic cologne. It'll give you, you know, a bonus on perception. So I think that's a, just a very important point that if you want magic to feel more magical, but again, you don't want to make a completely different system, just remember that the rules are the foundation, but we build the story on top of that. And you can add that flavor. That's right, yeah, and a lot of that is in, in the game master and player's hands, right? So our bolt spell, for example, if a GM just says he casts a bolt at you, okay, you you know, you, you do the mechanics and you move on. <clears throat> if he says he fires a flurry of flaming arrows at you or you know, however much you want to describe it, that feels different, and the players will notice that. So while in another panel we may give all the advice about how to describe things and describe the action and the combat and so forth, in reality, at most conventions, you know, when I see not not at our table, but just with strangers is, you know, I'm going to cast bolt. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do we reinforce that? Probably a whole nother discussion. But it is something we try to do. 
And then I'll, I'll throw my last bit in here. Um, I did a uh, Torg Eternity for Ulysses a couple of years ago. And that is, it's another system where there's all these different genres and a lot of the spells are the same, but we, and we do this with Savage Worlds too, but we have kind of a, a core group of spells, powers that people use and you, you put different trappings and flavors on them. But then the different classes, for lack of a better word, have their own unique spells that only they have access to as well. So the player feels cool and special and like they can do something no one else can't. Right. Yeah, I love that. Celeste, I would love to hear your thoughts on this because again, you are literally creating <laughs> yeah. a new RPG system right now. Yeah, yeah. So where did, I mean, I, where I, you started? I, oh yeah, I, I feel like both, you know, Shane and Keith have, have touched on elements of my answer here, which is basically when you start off, you need to decide how your characters are going to be able to interact with the magic. So this is true whether you're writing a fictional book or whether you're designing a game system, you need to think about what does it look like? What are we gonna see? What are the characters gonna see? How are they gonna experience this? How difficult is it going to be? You know, if you're writing like a low magic setting where magic is really hard and it takes a lot of effort, if you want to create that, you're going to be able to build mechanics or have to build mechanics to support that. So looking at how difficult is it to find, do, are there lots of pieces? Like, like you were saying, do you need different tools? Like how, how do you have a lot of classes that have magic? Do you not? Like, so really deciding how accessible it is to the characters is a really big step when creating a new system. Uh, and then looking at it, if it is very unaccessible, how do you build that in a game? So it's it's really interesting to see like a lot of um, indie RPGs, like things like Monster of the Week, for instance, like magic is framed as like, hey, this is a big deal. It's super weird. It's a huge narrative thing when your characters get together to make a ritual and make that happen. So it's very difficult because it's very special. Whereas in D&D, we're running around talking, you know, fooling in cantrips and, and all kinds of things and magic is all over the place. So really deciding, yeah, how the characters are going to interact with it, how prevalent it's going to be in your game is a really great first step when deciding uh, making your own magic system. I love that so much because it really links back to Keith's first point, yeah. which was essentially, what what are we doing here? Um, <laughs> and I think, again, I'm, I'm, I'm the interviewer. I'm not supposed to have an opinion, but I'm just going to sl slide one in here. We should always be asking what kind of fun we are having, and yeah. that's really what the magic system is all about. Are we are we doing uh, are we having fun that is like dark and gritty and horrible fun? In which case, that's what the magic system is, right? We've got blood, we've got death, we've got horrible things. Are we having rainbow fun? Are we having pirate fun? Because whatever kind of fun we're having, the magic system is supposed to reinforce that. So for for me personally, that's where I start, right? Like, what kind of fun are we having? How are we going to get this thing off the ground? I'll, I'll just throw out one more random thing that I tried at one point, just in the same experimenting sort of thing. And the point was, this was something I did for a one shot, and it was interesting for a one shot. But my conclusion was, this is too much trouble for an ongoing campaign just with my friends. And it was, uh, you know, I've always been slightly disappointed in standard D&D &D about the magic of clerics and the magic of wizards doesn't feel that different. It's mainly, mm -hmm. oh, one heals, one hurts. But I mean the concept of what they do is so completely different. One is asking the universe to help and it answers. One is using science. Uh, and I just added a layer into this one shot where basically all divine magic, the caster or the subject had to make a vow. You had to basically make a promise, you know, to, to get the blessing. Whereas all arcane magic had a price, but the wizard could make someone else pay that price. Like they could basically say, oh, someone is going to have to take five points of damage when I cast this fireball. And it's going to be you, Celeste. Whereas the, the cleric had to ask you, like, either will you make this vow? If Which you feels don't, totally to. different, right? And, and forms uh, immediately. Uh, really yeah, cool. those differences. And, and it just had that point of, in a way, arcane magic is creepier. Ooh, it's, it's more painful. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, divine magic, and as I said, it was great for that one shot. It was a fun thing, but it's not like I felt like, oh, I'm, I'm making that my main system. But also part of the point of that was magic was a little harder to use. Yeah. You know, it was adding not just a practical level, but when someone casts a spell, we have to stop and go through this whole process of what's your vow? What's your thing? Whereas, as we said, sometimes you just want to cast blast, you know? Yeah. Okay, so we've decided where we're going to start. We know, we know kind of what our magic is supposed to be doing. Now we need to get a bit nutsy-boltsy with it. 
what are the essential elements of a magic system? Celeste, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think, uh, and this is something that I've, I've had a lot of fun thinking about with with Black Flag, especially as we've uh, ju we actually just dropped our playtest packet that had a bunch of like spell casting rules and stuff. So this has like been on my mind, and I love it. Uh, so I think everything for magic, you have to decide what is the source, and then what is like the trigger are mm -hmm. going to be your two things. So your source of magic is going to be, you know, like as an example, in our system, we have the four circles of magic, right? That represent the sources. So we have our divine source, which is always a negotiation between the caster and one other creature. Uh, and then we have arcane, which is a recombination of like natural laws of the universe. So playing with things like gravity, heat, you have to have some kind of base to manipulate. Uh, and then once you have your source and you establish whatever that is, like wherever magic comes from uh, in your world, how do people interact with it? The trigger is the next thing. So that would be like the personal negotiation between the source and like a spellcaster's will. So if you have the will to manipulate what comes from the source, then you can effectively make something happen. So deciding that trigger and then deciding those sources are going to be huge for you. And those sources are a huge part of world building because mm. whether magic is a native part of the universe, you know, that tapestry, that's a huge decision that's going to impact how magic appears in your world. Whether if it's something you have to go and reach from a realm beyond reality to pull in, that's huge. You've already created a realm beyond reality, which is going to shape your world. So <laughs> in that way, those are the two, I think, core things you have to identify when I think about the magic system. That's so interesting. Shane, what are your thoughts on this? Um, <clears throat> so the nuts and bolts, you know, we 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 focus really hard on on playable games, right? Because again, we have so many different genres we cover. We we try to keep the mechanics of it simple. We work really hard to make all the stuff that goes on uh, behind the scenes ahead of time for you so that it's it's simple to play. Um, I think what Celeste said is, is just dead on in terms of, you know, how does it work for each world? And, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm so jealous of people who write novels where they create mag magic systems because you know, they can do whatever they want, right? They don't have to translate that into mechanics, right? Yeah. So, you know, you read most novels and the, the, the apprentice is exhausted after he casts his spell or something. Well, that's great narratively, but in a game, do you want your character to be useless after you cast a spell or something, right? So you have to find a balance there. And there's so many different examples of, of spell casting systems I can think of that have weird prices that work great in, in narrative, but not so much in game terms. Dark Sun, for example, Defilers, they kill the vegetation around them when they cast. Okay, great narratively. What does that mean in a game? I don't care if I kill some plants around me, right? What does that do to me? Keith's uh, system that he talked about a second ago the negotiation of, you know, will you give me your hit points? I'm going to take your hit points. That's really cool, right? That's a, a, a wonderful way to translate that idea into the mechanics. So I, I think it starts with, you know, again, what is the world and what are we trying to reflect? And then let's, what I tend to do is go ahead and build it the complicated way. So I see all the bits and pieces. And then I try to, to crunch that down into the most streamlined uh, effort possible. And sometimes you lose some fidelity in there, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, and some granularity. But in the end, it, it makes for a better play experience. So that is what I'm always focused on is the play. Whereas if I'm going to write a novel or something, you know, and I have written a few, that's a different kind of effort. So, you know, for me, it is, is this going to work in play? Is this guy's turn going to take 10 minutes longer than everyone else's? That's a big deal. Original yeah. deadlines have that problem. So that's something we fixed in, in Savage Rolls On. Amazing. And I'm so glad that you mentioned novel writers because I happen to know that Keith is a published novel writer as well. Keith, that what are your true. thoughts on this? Essential elements of magic. So I agree completely with everything Shane and Celeste have said, and I'm not going to retread that. So Celeste talked about the sort of fundamental concept, you know, the, you know, uh, how does magic function in this reality? Shane talked about the mechanics of how magic actually works at the table to me sort of the extra piece i would also always be considering is essentially the cost of magic within the world and how that actually affects 
play. And on the one hand, that can be something like we talked about with the negotiations or like Shane mentioned with defiling. But on the other hand, the question is like, is there an actual resource in the world that is required? So for example, in Eberron, we have dragon shards, you know, and dragon shards are the fuel of the magical economy. And because of that, because of first off, uh, magic plays an industrial role. It is a common sort of tool, but it means that dragon shards have value. You know, who's got them, who's mining them. Conversely, if you're dealing with like blood magic where it kills people to use it, that's going to make a very different sort of flavor to your world and society, make magic rarer and darker. Uh, one of just the little things I always sort of throw out in terms of thinking about this is uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, the spell raise dead. If you are playing in a world where that actually is a service that exists, because like in Eberron, we generally don't go that high level. But if you're playing in a world where raise dead, you can go somewhere and pay to have the dead raised. Raise dead uses 5,000 gold pieces worth of diamonds. And one of the things I always immediately say is, who's got the diamonds? Because whoever has diamonds in this world, whoever has the diamond mines, controls life and death. Right. And that is a fascinating thing to stop and think about. And of course, there's this bizarre, weird, circular problem of it doesn't take a certain amount of diamonds. It takes a certain value of diamonds. And now we get into who's setting that price. But, you know, that's a thing that you say, assumably, there is some sort of universal value. But still that point that in a world where raised dead uses diamonds, the person who has the diamonds holds a bizarre level of power that people often you know, just don't think about. But I think it's fascinating to like think about those life merchants. You know, so as I said, I like to sort of think what is the cost of magic, what are the resources associated with it, and how is that affecting sort of society and culture and politics within your world? Yeah, absolutely. We had Mary Robinette Cowell earlier talking about methods of world building. One of the things she said was exactly that, you know, if you've established something in your world, go ahead and have a think about right. what the implications of this thing are, right? And and the point is, you don't have to, you know, with the Ray is Dead thing, you can just not worry about it and just say whatever. But I always think it's much more interesting when you do and, you know, that can create a whole interesting system. The villain who's the diamond merchant who's, you know, again, like the, the holder of life. So, yeah. I'm picturing a scene in a novel now where the raised dead spell comes up, right? And the guy says, well, I've only got, you know, 15 bucks worth of diamonds. And his friend says, I'll pay you $5,000 for that. Diamond. Exactly. Now worth $5,000 gold pieces. Yeah. That's really fascinating, Keith. Yeah, absolutely. Um. <laughs> For me, it all comes down to cost, limitations, and power. That's It's that magical triangle. Yep. Cost, limitations, power. If you have all three of them, you've probably got a magic system that's not going to blow up your world. Eh. This is actually kind of my next question. How can you stop your magic from getting OP? Everybody worries about this game, game uh, creators especially, because you, know, you, can, uh, you can turn the heads of the protagonists in your novels a little bit, but... Um, Players will players will go ahead and do things in your world. So how can you how can you manage that with magic? I mean, immediate thing I would just jump on again is cost. What is the cost? And there's so many different ways to you know approach this. Uh, as Shane said, I mean the biggest thing is it's a very different question if you're dealing with it mechanically in a role playing game versus if you're dealing with it narratively in a uh, novel, in which case you have a lot more freedom to just say, oh, it drains the strength of the people who use it. Um, but I mean, that's that's sort of the fundamental question we've approached in a bunch of different ways. You know, the idea that when I cast magic, I mean, like I love, uh, I had a thing in the last Eberron book I wrote where I was introducing the idea of the shadow, who's like theoretically the god of evil magic. And we're like, well, how does a spell granted by the shadow, how is it any different from anything else? And so I gave like a list of things that uh, you could get the spell that works a little better, but X happens. And one of the things was saying, every time you cast this spell, an innocent person dies. Mm. And it's the, the box from, you know, the Twilight Zone of you may never met them, meet this person. You don't know, you know, but I'm telling you, every time you cast this spell, someone dies. Are you going to do it? Um, and so, I mean, that, of course, is, is a, a very abstracted way, but it's still that question. You can have just what we were just saying, raise dead. The cost can be a straightforward, do you have the diamonds? And if you don't, 
you're not casting the spell. It can be abstract in the someone's going to die if you cast this spell. It can be the Vancian slot system. You're just out of energy. But I mean, basically, the, the key to balance is, you know, what is the cost? What are the limitations? Yeah. Celeste, what are your thoughts on this? I would say, yeah. I mean, obviously, like Keith said, the consequences of things are going to be so important. So in terms of resource, like crunchy mechanics, and then also in terms of narrative consequences. I think the the big thing, because a lot of people with games like D&D in particular, they're like, how do I run high levels? Like, this is impossible. I have my characters running around, you know, reshaping the universe with their will. The thing is, if you have villains and other forces that also have access to that amount of power and you really give enough time to make those other characters in the world have that very very quickly the characters will start realizing hey if i'm abusing my power like this just imagine all the other people who are out there abusing it and the way they can use it against me so when you really make those narrative consequences clear, so you know when your when your wizards start feeling like a total badass, nobody can hit me. Give them that lich, introduce that rival lich, you know that has everything in their bag that can shut down, redirect, or you know start coming after people with the dream spell. Really make sure that you're building on either side with your magic systems. That everything your characters, your heroes get access to, the villains have access to as well, and really make sure to drive that home. Because if you have magical fortresses ruled by evil wizards, you can bet your you can bet your bottom that they're not going to be able to, like characters won't be able to just teleport in there. They're going to have magical wards to deal with. They're going to have magical constructs to deal with, curses, all kinds of nasty stuff. So make sure, I guess, the, the counterpoint, you know, is if your system is powerful for your heroes, make sure it's equally as powerful for your villains. So then overpower isn't really so much an issue because you're just in a higher punching category now. It's just so an arms world. race. Exactly. I'm here for that. I love exactly. that. Shane, what are your thoughts yeah. about this? Yeah. Um, I guess we approach it from a practical point of view. There is uh, in combat magic in a, in a traditional style game and out of combat magic, right? And in combat, it's, it's a resource management thing. So we have PowerPoints and you have those, you know, they work in conceptually much like spell slots. You know, you have a certain amount of resources you can use and, and you do so. When you get out of combat, that's where it gets a little trickier, right? So you can cast whatever you want and either you take a long rest afterwards or you regain your power points or whatever. So you have to put some sort of additional cost on it, like Keith was talking about with diamonds or whatever, right? So that's, that's the practical way most of these things are done. We hit on something um, in East Texas University, which is one of our, our games, if you can see that. That's very blurry. Um, hey, there we go. Yeah. But it's something uh, super fun. It's not even just a resource management. It's how can we turn this into an adventure? So you cast the, the stu there are students in the game, kind of, you know, Buffy, a college sort of uh, background. And often they will have to cast spells to stop a demon from entering the world or, or far more mundane things like use locate object on some poor student's car keys to find out where she disappeared to or something, right? So the cool thing is that there is a, a ritual components table that the, the power of the spell will tell you what components, what kinds of components you've got to gather, and then you get a list of them. And most spells have an exotic component or even kind of a black magic component. And that means, you know, I might run around and have to find uh, an entire barrel of lubricant and, uh, you know, bizarre things, right, which lead to these wacky adventures. But then one of them might be like, you know, the finger of a corpse. Well, you know, in D&D, that's easy, right? But in a small town in Texas, where do you get that? Yeah. Right? And that yeah. leads to a whole other adventure and shenanigans. And that's, you know, that reflects the world and what it's all about. And it makes that whole system fun, where, whereas, you know, finding the diamonds, I think, would also be fun if the GM is going to, you know, inflict that on the character say, well, you know, there's, there's this diamond merchant in town and he knows why you're there. Right. Yeah. So that's to make it fun, I guess, is, is my answer. One last thing I throw in too, just going back a little bit to what I was saying earlier about the artificer and almost going in the opposite direction from Celeste, you know, on the one hand is Celeste was saying, don't forget that the, the NPCs have access to the same magic the players do. On the other hand, one of the things we call out in Eberron a lot is actually the NPCs have access to different magic than the players mm. do. Like one of the points is what we're saying is the player character wizard 
Like that is not, you know, most spellcasters are not wizards. They're what we call mage rights. And they're sort of working class. And the wizard represents this sort of genius, the guy who would build a computer in his, his garage, not the regular electrician. And part of the point of that is saying that the typical mage right can't just pick up a book in the morning and completely change their spells. Like they have learned a very specific set of spells, but at the same time, they may actually be better at those than the character casting, you know, because they are the absolute specialist that augury only lets you look 24 hours in advance. Well, when you go talk to the Oracle on the street, she can cast augury, you know, a week in advance because that's all she does. Yeah. You know, and uh, and that basically it's okay to sort of fudge the rules a little when you're dealing with someone who's saying, like, all this guy is is the arcane locksmith. And yes, all he does is knock an arcane lock, but he is more efficient at it than the player who just sort of says, I feel like casting knocks today. Let me read my book, you know. Um, one of the little things I, I call out there is in particular, Eberron's a setting where we deal with the idea that there's recently been a great war. And the idea that we look at things like a fireball and say, that's our big spell. But the thing about a fireball is it's a 30 foot radius, which is actually fairly small and eight dice of damage, which is pretty overkill if you're actually fighting commoners. And so we're like, okay, well, there's probably a spell out there that is like a 200 foot radius spell, but only does two dice of damage. Because that is enough to actually kill a whole bunch of conscripts. And it won't actually scratch player characters, which is great, because then you can have explosions on the battlefield and the player character makes it through. Um, but the, the main point is just that, obviously, as Celeste was saying, the bad guys can use the spells that you know, but also consider the bad guys could use spells that you don't know if you're positing that it takes 10 years of just studying augury to sort of have this level of, of this particular augury effect. What I really love about the spread of answers we have here is that they are all approaching magic as story in different ways. We have Celeste talking about the arms race and building up your villains. You know, we have Shane talking about the idea that, you know, costs can be quests. And I think that's so beautiful. And uh, again, Keith talking about the idea that, you know, your villains can have strange and weird things. You know, not everybody has well, the same thing. And that's something that makes the world so fascinating. I, I absolutely, I am here for this. This, this is what I'm all about. It's it's the last thing I'll drop in, but it's the same way I said with guidance. When casting guidance, stop and think about what are you actually doing. Uh, prestidigitation. D and D has a bunch of spells like prestidigitation that do a lot of different things. It cleans, it soils, it flavors, it does whatever. I like to sort of call out and I have the thing that maybe those are ten different spells. It's not that I'm just casting prestidigitation and choosing this effect. It's that I'm using tensors, you know, soiling, uh, you know, sriracha or whatever it is. And that that's back to that story. It can add more fun if you say, oh, you know, I'm using the, you know, the tepid temperature tra transformation. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's exactly back to what Shane talked about earlier of obviously for practicality, it is easier just to say you just know prestidigitation. But that again doesn't mean that as the caster, you can't add a little flair to it if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that actually brings me so nicely to my next question. Um, this is a... This is one really about exposition, like, and actually, Shane, I want you to start on this because it's so uh, relevant to what you were talking about, about your, your experience with creating all of these different magic systems and how it was hard for players. Do you have any tips for explaining magic systems to your players or readers and how important it is to explain it? So this isn't just like, okay, you're a wizard, here are your spells, read them before you come to the first session. This is, you know, about, about in-world magic, about changes in magic. How can we explain that in a way that feels magical and feels like positive exposition rather than a big old expo dump on what's going on? What are your thoughts? I guess I would flip that around. I would make sure they understand the mechanics of it or guide them through it myself if I'm the game master. But rather than telling them how it works, and, and this depends on your game system, of course, I and, I and I do this, I would ask them how it works, mm. right? So in uh, Deadlands, uh, hucksters do deals with, with we call them manitous, but they're, they're demons, uh, to cast, cast their spells, right? And they might cast a, a boost trait on somebody to raise their strength. And I'd say, 
you know, tell me what that, if I have time, right? If it makes sense, it's not interrupting the flow of the action and so on. I'd say, tell me what that looks like. You know, okay, in, in your mind, you're playing this, this game with this Manitou in the hunting grounds. It might take an hour. But in reality, you know, what, what do we see? How does it affect them? And, uh, and, and that, can be, that can be really cool if they, they, they will probably mess it up the first few times. It takes a little while to grasp that, right? It's easier once you get into alchemy or mad science or something like that. Alchemy is something we struggled with quite a bit with our power system. Not, not with the powers, but, okay, so how do you, how do you apply this uh, boost trait to somebody? Well, I give them a potion. Well, you're, you're 50 feet away. How do you do that, right? So... Right. So we said, well, I, well, I, I throw a, a grenade or like a water balloon kind of thing. Like, nah, nah, nah. Molotov healing yeah. cocktail. Yeah. So, you know, with, with us and with our system, we, we kind of let them start feeling it out and explaining. Now we have rules for all, you know, how these things are applied and so forth. But again, we really want it to come holistically from the player, how they envision it. And after I found, after you do that a few times, especially at conventions where people aren't maybe used to playing our game, they really start to get into that, right? Well, I cast bolt, but what you actually see is I summon the bees from the forest around me and I hurl them at my opponent through my fingers and they sting in these swirling streams of, of pain. I'm like, okay, that's great. Roll your damage. <laughs> I love that. By the power of bees, I'm here for it. Now, the Celeste, you are literally bees. explaining magic systems right now. So <laughs> what, are, yeah. what are your rules? Yeah, I think for me, my biggest tip would be uh, what you have the advantage of doing when you're doing a game, uh, you can ask your players directly how involved they want to be uh, in the process. So like I know, for instance, me, I love playing wizards because I like feeling like I have a sense of mastery over magic in the world. So that's really important to me when I make a character that I feel like my character will know things. So I want to be able to talk to my GM and be like okay how does it work i think i should know this maybe i should have advantage on these checks you know like because it's so important to me whereas i have players like uh, we have a fighter in my ongoing game right now who just like multi-classed into druid and i was like okay this is interesting is this something you plan to happen in character or is this something that happened to you and she was like oh cool no I, I it happened to me so i don't understand what's happening I, I i maybe i do this and this and then she got really excited about the fact that her character didn't understand what was happening and she wanted to learn that way through through having it happen to her so i feel like every character every player is going to have a, a little bit of a different preference some people want to walk in there and know everything and some people want to play games like bloodborne and then be like where am i i'm dropped in the middle of this why is everything with tentacles you know like that that can be a huge part of the explanation so ask your players directly figure out what kind of fun they want to have and then that will really help guide you how much exposition do you need how much do you be a part of the conversation where you directly explain versus showing yeah go ahead keith and i do think you know that comes sort of you were saying players or readers and and that comes to that question again are we doing a game system are we doing fiction and i think celeste hit on it with with telling versus showing and that i think in a fictional situation part of the point is again you never want to overburden people right away you want to give them enough that they understand the basic concept we're doing magic by making deals with spirits we're doing magic by channeling elemental forces you know uh, but ooh, but it takes a toll on the physical body you know give them as sort of brief a core explanation as you can and then show it you know expand on it every time someone casts a spell add a little more detail what is that like how does it affect you what are you making you know with the deal so that's the point to me is is don't try and cram it all in right away see if you can uh sort of squeeze it in uh, as you go give a little more detail you know again drawing the player you know whether it's a player or whether it's a reader drawing them into the world as you go instead of trying to put too much work on them right away i do think another thing about what celeste said that struck me as interesting is the question of the wizard having mastery versus the other characters not uh one thing again same sort of time as i was thinking about the the vows versus price uh in the other system Another thing I have occasionally done is for divine magic, actually with the permission of the player, you know, talking to them, saying, are you okay with the idea that your magic is not quite as much in your control? 
that you might be given a particular spell instead of choosing all your spells because this is the spell they want you to have today. Or in particular, the idea that they could walk into a bar and I'm going to say, when you look at the innkeeper, you see a burning crown floating above his head. And that's all I'm going to tell them about that. And, you know, the point being that the divine, you know, divine magic isn't a science. What is, what is their power source trying to tell them by showing them this burning crown, you know, and that in fiction, like I'm particularly thinking of Game of Thrones where you have the priests of the red god and they are very mysterious and they know shit they shouldn't know and it's creepy as heck. And I'm like, that's really cool, but I have never met a cleric who feels like that. And I'm like, because clerics, because again, their D, their magic in D&D is reliable. It has to be. And I'm saying, but with the player's permission, you can throw in those sort of, I'm just going to tell you that this guy is going to die tomorrow. And I'm just giving you that information because that's what your power is telling you. What do you do with that? Why are they telling you? I don't know. But that's a thing that can make a cleric and a wizard feel very different. If the wizard is the master, but that means it's very reliable, whereas the cleric is you know, getting the universe is giving them shit. Yeah, absolutely. I also think that there is a potential here in gaming, particularly for that player character divide. And it's a really hard thing. Not all players can do this. But one of my absolute joys, if I do sp play a spellcaster, which I don't very often, I play a spellcaster that does not know what the hell is going on. Uh, because I find that entertaining for myself personally. So like as a player, I know that I'm going to do D6 damage, but as a character, I'm like, I'm going to point my hand and see what happens. Ah! Um, and, and that is another approach that you can have. Like, you know, the thing there is a there is a conceit in RPGs that the player and the character know different information, you know. Can I uh, give a shout out to a system that is is not mine, but I, I love, you know, it's Bring one it. of my favorite ones they've used is uh, the cut ups method, which is something Robin Robin Law has created for over the edge. And it's something I've used a lot for magic in that, which is basically, you know, normal everyday magic, you're casting your cantrip, use whatever reliable system. Uh, but the cut-ups method I like to use for rituals, and the way it works is instead of rolling dice, normally over the edge is a dice-based system, you roll a dice pool. And in the cut-ups method, instead of rolling dice, as the DM, I'm going to grab a book, and I'm going to flip through the book, and I'm going to randomly grab a random word, whatever catches my eye, for each die they should roll. If they have five dice, I'm going to just flip through the book and say, windmill, sorry, orange, uh, you know, well, and despair. Those are your five words. And now you have to basically, in a paragraph, roughly, describe to me the effect you are trying to, to generate. And I'm going to judge your success based on how well those words fit into what you're describing. Oh, that's so cool and, and weird. And what I like about it, having used this a bunch of times, is the point is what it ends up meaning is that the wizard doesn't necessarily entirely know what they're going to do until they start doing it. Because they may have planned to cast a fireball, but then all these spells clearly say, no, apparently I'm doing some kind of fear wind thing. Danger and, <laughs> But this comes back to what we started with at the very beginning of the point is, I love that system. It just makes it very different and very interesting. But the whole point of it is it's not reliable. It's not something you know, you know, when you cast that spell, it's going to be a little bit of a, a wonder what you get. Uh, and again, also, while it's a lot of fun, it's very creative, it's slow. This is a point at which we stop the game for about five or ten minutes while the player comes up with their spell. So it's cool and it's creative, but it's not the thing where you want to use this every time someone does a magic missile. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going on to our audience questions now because, good Lord, the time is flying. And several people have actually asked the question that Keith just answered. Best or a favorite example, interesting or well-crafted magic systems? What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm going to pick Celeste next. Celeste, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so as just a, a narrative example, I love when magic feels hard. Like it feels like it really exacts a toll. And so one of my favorite uh, novel series, Harry Dresden, the Dresden file series for this, like he gets his ass handed to him over and over again. And magic is always so hard and it feels hard and you can see it. Literally his body and his mind is destroyed every book by these spells he's casting. So like, I, that's a great 
thing to just check out, recommend. Um, also, narratively inspiration, um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell is the best series example of what wizard versus sorcerer feels like to me. Uh, so definitely check that out. I would say, yeah, like find these narrative sources that inspire you and really nail the feeling of magic. And then that will help you so much inform it mechanically and like i mentioned earlier monster of the week is a great game i love how they approach like the ritual based storytelling like where everybody really has to buy in to make big magic happen uh they literally call it big magic that's it's such a big deal uh so yeah there's a lot of cool stuff i mean dcc uh just has a lot of wacky stuff going on like with with their magic uh so there's a lot of cool stuff uh out there for sure Amazing. Keith, I don't want you to feel like you were gazumped. Do you have another favorite or um, inspirational magic system that we should go and check out? Uh, I mean, I, I think I've, I've said, you know, as I say, I love the Cutwas method. That's a very interesting mechanical system. Uh, I will just throw out, since we're mentioning books, one of the things I love that, that doesn't fit this traditional style, uh, but I'm always very interested, uh, Tim Powers is an author who does a lot of interesting things with specific types of magic sort of each of his books deals with some different magical concept like the book last call deals with sort of tarot divination the book declare deals more with like dealing with jinn and things and what i like about those is they're both very different but they're very much how would this uh impact uh, how would this happen in the real world? Here's a spy novel, but what if genies were real? You know, here's, uh, you know, just a guy living in LA and not LA, Las uh, Vegas and dealing with gangsters. But what if the Fisher King was involved? And I do like that kind of magic realism, if you will. Yeah, which, I mean, you wrote everyone. That makes total sense. <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> Shane, what are your thoughts? Your best or favorite examples of well-crafted magic systems? Gosh, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the unthinkable here and name our own, but uh, <gasps> I, I, do it, I do it. Tell us why you love magic, it. Magic, you know, where you use poker hands for 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 magic. I think that's just fantastic. We slowed it down in Savage Worlds. You only do it on occasion rather than every hand because it, it took a while. And uh, I'll tell you that the hardest one I find to translate is kind of the old pulp swords and sorcery uh, magic. So Conan, Lankmar, that kind of thing. And those results are incredibly powerful and, and they take a, a great toll on the sorcerers who use them, but that's really hard to translate to a player character. It's easy to do for your villains, right? They're twisted uh, versions of what they used to be or whatever, but uh, it's really hard to translate into PCs. We actually tried to do it and you can judge for yourself how successful it was in our new fantasy companion where you have access to powers that change the world like that but the cost is high. So I, I think my, my favorite will be whoever figures out how to do that on a or perhaps an easier uh, basis. Amazing. Well, I have one final question. I have three guests. I have three minutes left. Can you please remind us who are you and where can we find you? Celeste, why don't you take us away with this? Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Once again, my name is Celeste Conowich. I am the senior game designer for Cobalt Press, currently uh, the lead designer on Project Black Flag. Uh, so I would totally invite you to come see the Cobalt Press website, learn more, get involved, playtest packets, feedback forms, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, and then also, if you want to see me putting this advice into practice, you can always listen or watch uh, my show, Venture Maidens, uh, which is a DD and d 5th edition actual play podcast, all fey nonsense, all up in there. Uh, uh, and for, you know, the quickest and latest updates, make sure to follow me on Twitter at C. Conowich. Hooray! And Shane, who are you and where can we find you? I'm Shane Hensley, creator of Deadland, Savage Worlds, and a whole bunch of other nonsense. Uh, I've known Keith for years. I always look forward to seeing what he's doing next. And it was a great pleasure to meet you, Celeste. I'm a big fan of Wolfgang and the gang over at Cobalt Press. And I think Black Flag is going to be fantastic. So nice to meet you as well. And all of the awesome stuff. Uh, a big fan. <laughs> I love it when my guests fan out, fan, like fan about each other. I think that's amazing. And of course, Keith, as if I have to ask, who are you and where can we find you? Uh, I am Keith Baker. I am easily found at togetherstudios.com and you can see it's T-W-O as they're on the screen or and pretty much on socials. I'm either Hellcal Keith or Together Studios. And I agree with Shane. This has just been a fantastic chance 
especially over the last few years, as we've all been so isolated, it is fantastic to see people and meet people. And so thank you so much, uh, Janet and Moral Ample for, for doing this. Oh, it is our absolute pleasure. As I've said before, and I will say again, we are passionate about getting people in the online space to hear amazing thought leaders. It's so hard for so many people to leave the house. It's hard to get places, particularly the States where you guys all live. Um, it's expensive. It's difficult. We want to we want to change all that. So, uh, yeah, more on more online things with amazing people. That's what World Building Con is all about. You've done an excellent job putting it all together. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. I know how hard this is. <laughs> Oh, yes. Well, Shane, thank you. And thank you all, all of my panelists so very much. I feel like we could easily have gone on for another hour. I would have loved that. But of course, you guys have to get off to your real lives. And we, well, we're back in 10, guys. We are back with fantasy world building, inverting the tropes with the great senior designer over at Wizards of the Coast, Amanda Hammond, and the best-selling New York Times, everything that is amazing in the world, Gail Carriger. So folks, I will see you in 10 for that. Uh, lovely people on the screen. Thank you so, so very much for your time and your wisdom. And as we say over in World Anvil, grab your hammer and go world build.